Alright, we're gonna get started. And, uh, we got quite a bit to cover today, so I'm gonna try to get this all in a bit of time. So, uh, ask Rick if you want to just open us in a word of prayer. Thank you for just a great turn. Thank you that well, you just I just believe you are on and it's just exciting to see that as we see again four new families in church. Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory for that. Lord, we just thank you for this study that we can just continue to do your church. Thank you for Ira that's going to teach it. But we just ask that you just be in our midst today and just open our eyes to the truth of the world. We pray you say Amen. Amen. All right. So let's just quickly recap. Um, last week, we talked about God, uh, we looked at Genesis 1, and we looked at the Genesis account of God creating order, and that the creation story is framed as God, we started with, after he, after he first creates reality, says the earth is tohu wabohu, without form and empty, and then the rest of creation story is God taking disorder and creating order. He separates and then he fills. He separates and he fills. So the first you know, the first three days he separates uh, uh, sky and sky and uh, land, sky and water, and then he creates land, water and land, and then um, I forget what the third one is, and then he, then he starts filling it with first the lights and the animals and then finally the night. So then we talked about man being created in God's image and the idea that then we carry that on. So, and then we did a little quick aside. We talked about the flood. We talked about the fact that the primary way in the Bible that God judges, we tend to think we are very Western. We, 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 we think like the Greeks. And so we tend to think in terms of laws and, and uh, organizational structure. So we think in terms of, so when we say judgment, what we think of is we think someone in a in a judge's robe with a with a mallet, you know, a gavel, pronouncing a punishment. We hear judgment, we think punishment. And yet we saw that one of the one of the primary ways that God executes judgment is to simply withdraw his imposition of order. In other words, if you're gonna reject me, then you can do this without me. And, and so he withdraws the imposition of order, which creates disorder. So I wanted to show you. So Psalm 81, 12. My people, verse 81, 11. My people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over. There's this phrase. I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. So this is Psalms. And here is this idea of God says, because they decided to not know me, they decided to not listen to me, therefore I gave them over to do it their way. That's what it means, to walk in their own devices, to let them be stubborn. And so rather than God intervening for good, he says, I'm just going to not intervene anymore. We see this all the way through uh, Israel's history. You think about, we, we tend to think of, Israel got punished by God saying, okay, I'm going to send all these people to invade you. But if you look at Israel, and you look at the land that God gave them, that was some of the most invadable land he could have possibly given them. Okay? I mean, one of the things about America that's always made America uh, very powerful is the fact that we're not easily invaded. Why? Because we're founded by oceans. So it's not even, but Germany or Poland, France, they're accessible. So you tend to fight wars there because people fight over it. Well, the Middle East, it's the major trade route between three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, all pass through Israel. So it's very desirable land that also has a lot of other riches. So God says, I'm going to put my people there. And probably about the worst place you could ever put people if you wanted to keep them safe. And then what does he tell them? And if you walk with me, no one will ever invade you. Well, that's unnatural. That's crazy. Because everyone's going to want to invade you. He says, but I will impose an order upon you that's not natural. 
And then when they don't follow him, he says, okay. And he steps back, and what? Here comes Babylon, and here comes Egypt, and here comes the Middle Persian Empire, and they get invaded every other thing. But God's not like, okay, I've got to go find some Babylonians. He's like, no, all right, I'm just, I'm out. And now I'm going to let him come. I'm going to let him come. So it's God saying, I'm handing you over to whatever you want. That's your punishment. And we do this. My grandmother, remember her telling me the story, of she didn't like having a pet. She wanted to stay up and not have to go to bed. So finally, your dad said, you can't. But of course, this is before electricity. And so, the rest of the family went to bed. And she said, and I sat there in the living room, and I was all, I, I don't have to go to bed. She goes, I sat there for half an hour, and the only light I had was the, the light from the fire. And the house was quiet and dark, and I went to bed. Because getting what I wanted was not pleasurable. All right, so, God gave them over. We see this in Psalm 811. So now, question. What is immorality? Discussion question. Briefly. How would you define immorality? And I could sound, make it the preacher voice. And we have such immorality in the days today in the world. How would you define immorality? Self-indulgent. Okay, self-indulgent? How? Oh. Like when you when you hear the word, what pops to mind? Especially in our day and age. Sex. All that degradation, right? It's almost like a sneery voice of degradation. Anybody else? Or did we just cover it really well? Pursuit of power. Hmm? Pursuit of power. The pursuit of power. Interesting, interesting. All right, well, how would you define morality? I said we need to really get back to morality. How would you define it? Following the did you say rules? Following the rules. Anyone else want to take a shot at defining morality? If you have good morals, then I kind of I think that like a, someone who's solid in their faith, kind of like good morals, kind of goes with that. But what would make morals good? Like what would be an example of good morals? Selflessness. Yep. Selflessness. Selflessness. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I mean, we need good morals. Okay. Just to be good. Well, let's get back to what Christy mentioned, following the rules. So do we define morality by the law? Now, how do we tend to define justice and punishment? The application of law, right? And then again, we get back to the judge. And if you break the law and you get punished. And that's what we tend to think of. So you think of morality, you think of the moral law, which is based on what? What do we want to put everywhere and get them back into everything and get them in the school again? We need the Ten Commandments. Because if we follow the Ten Commandments, then everybody would be nice and moral. So is morality defined by law? I mean, isn't that the problem going on in our country now? That they're, they're changing the law so that it's not moral anymore? Yeah, we won't debate it. Well, let's try. Huh? Well, how about love and kindness for our fellow man? Damn, oh. liberal there. <laughs> <laughs> what if we define morality by character? Ooh, what's character? All right. Well, this is a book, and this is a person, okay? Rules are not personal. They're applied personally, but you give them a rule book, whether it's the Bible, or the Ten Commandments, a set, set, a set, set of standards. <laughs> a set, set of standards, okay? But character is the person, how the person chooses to act. All right, turn to Matthew 5.
All right, Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard that the ancients, that your forebears were told, thou shall not commit murder on the Ten Whoever commits murder shall be liable to court. But I say, everyone's angry with their brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to your brother, you good enough. Shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Who says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. All right, so what does he start with? He says, so you've heard this rule, but I tell you, if you act like this, and he redefines the first one of the laws, so I shall not kill. He redefines what, it, what he means by it, right? He starts with, just don't kill people, which is an action. That's a technical rule. But he says, but if your attitude in your heart Right? Verse 27. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman and lust in your heart, so you haven't done anything beyond, he says, you're already, you're already guilty. Verse 33. You've heard it said the ancients have told you shall not make false vows. He says, or you could just be honest. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye. I tell you, don't resist an evil person. Don't pursue justice for yourself. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I say, you should love the people who treat you care. So in all these cases, what is Jesus? Notice how Jesus is switching from a rule to what you're like. Your character. How you act instead of what rules you follow. So he's defining that what, what makes us moral as humans is not a set of behavioral standards, but something that happens inside you. That is how you think about things. Okay? Verse 48, therefore, this is my probably one of my biggest pet peeves for translation. Perfect. It's not an inaccurate translation, but we hear it inaccurately. Because the, the primary meaning in English to this day for perfect means to be flawless. But here, the meaning, the reason I try to say the word perfect means to be complete, means to finish. Okay? It doesn't mean without flaw, it means finished. Okay? So, like for instance, where it says my power is perfected, it doesn't mean it becomes flawless, it means it's finished, it's completed. So, therefore, be completed, be full. Be a finished human being the way your father is a finished being. Okay? It's changing your character. So now, what are we referring to here? We change markers here. So what this is talking about, another word we could call this, is the image of God. This is how we tie it the last week. God created man in his image. And now he says, and now what morality is, is living that image out, the image of God. Which is different than don't mess up my rules. Right? So character becomes, the image of God becomes morality. And the image of God, of course, means, again, coming back to rooting all this in Genesis, if you remember, if you were here last week, Tov and Ra, so I can't write. The tree of the knowledge of tov and ra, the tree of knowledge of good and bad. What is good and what is not good. Remember the whole narrative of Genesis uh, 3, well, 1, 2, and 3, is God said, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is not good. Eve looks at what God said is not good and says, I think that's good. <coughs> I take for myself the knowledge, the discernment of what is good and what's not so that now mankind looks at things and says, I think that's good, and God says, you're bad at that. There's a way that looks right to you, it ends in your death. All right? So we get back to the image of God, where we decide good and bad based on God, not on ourselves. <clears throat> so far, so good? This, for those of you who were here last week, this tie in well with what we talked about last week? And, and last week established all this. Okay. So now, 
the main event. All this was introductory to get to the main event. Romans 1. Romans 1. Why don't you turn there? This is the, the end of chapter 1, setting up the entire book of Romans. And it's looking at a Roman, it's written to Roman Christians. The Roman Empire is not a nice place, morally speaking. And he sets up what's going on as he's going to describe how we relate to the world. In Romans 1.18, let's work our way through here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. All right, what is this truth that they're suppressing? He's going to explain. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. What is he referring to? The image. He says they already know what God looks like. Why? Because they're made in his image. It's evident. God made it evident to them. But what, how do you want to know about God? He imaged himself in mankind. Four. And then, so he's going to elaborate. 20 just get his, it's the same thought continued. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, Divine nature been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they don't have an excuse. He's saying, you want to understand who God is, look how he imaged himself. Look at yourself. Whoa, because God created man in his own image. And so this, this is referring back to Genesis 1. And notice he's now if we go forward. We're going to see that he's still, he's going, he's talking about the order of creation, the fact that man was created, mankind was created in God's image. So look what he says. For even though they knew God, why? Because they're created in his image. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became useless, futile, pointless, in their speculations. It means just in their thinking, in their imaginings. Their foolish heart became unclear. That's to be darkened. It means it's hard to figure out. They professed to be wise, instead became foolish, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, that's the original image, for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So he says, man was created in God's image. Because they chose not to acknowledge him, they replaced the natural image of God with their own image that is based on themselves and creation. So this is the new image. So what is this back to? This is back to reimagining Tobin Rob. Reimagining how the world works and what it means. This is what Eve did. No one knew God was, she decided for herself. What? That which would make me better. That's what Genesis 3 said. She looked at it and said, this is desirable for making one wise and pleasurable. So now the image that's steering Eve is the image of herself, of man, and animals. Therefore, God... What? I'm trying to get a little bit of audience to speak. God what? <laughs> Gave... Now, over. There is the phrase. Therefore, the judgment of God fell on them. God said, okay, go. What did he give them over to? To, in the lust of their heart, to impurity, to whatever they wanted to do, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God, the image, for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So he's saying, all right, so what has man done? Even though God revealed himself through their creation, they replaced God's image with an image of themselves and with nature. Did whatever feels right to them. And so God said, all right, do it. 
Do what feels right to you. I want to read the book of Judges. Because there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The idea is, I'm making up my own toes are wrong. For this reason, God gave them over. There it is again. Two, degrading passions. And now this is where people get... This is the verses people quote, and it does mean what that means. To degrading passions, women exchange natural function for that which is unnatural. Men abandon the natural function of the woman and desired each other in decent acts. He says, so now notice, this is not the cause of those things. Now one of the things you'll hear today, a lot of people say, because of that sort of a behavior, because of that, God is going to bring judgment. I mean, has anybody, I guess what the question is, has anybody not heard that? Because that's what they said. You know, like, uh, America's going to go right down the tubes because God's going to bring judgment with all this. That is the judgment. It's not going to cause judgment. It is the judgment that man does whatever you want. He says, and now what's happening? Notice what he's talking about. The natural, the natural the original creation, the natural order has been unordered. The natural order is unordered. God gave them over, but he stopped imposing his, his order. And he says, and they exchanged his order for their own. He said, so originally, you know, what you have? You have a man and a woman, and that was natural. That's all the animals. That's how you had for creation, to create order and then to fill. He goes, but they abandoned that and just desired each other and not what was originally in nature. But this is not causing their punishment. It is the result of them no longer following the image of God, but following the image of themselves. So that's why we really stop, have to stop saying, don't. When people say, that's going to cause judgment, say, no, it's not. It is the judgment. He's letting them do whatever they want. And that's scary for you. Because you're being allowed to get away. Because God is no longer stepping in to stop you. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God, here we go again. God gave them over. Three times in a row. This is God saying, okay. The withdrawal of the imposition of God's order God's Tov and Ra being removed in favor of man's version. To do those things which are not proper. All right. <coughs> so at this point, this is where we're going to rubber boots the road and this is the rest of the whole lesson. Because we started with the question, what is immorality? What is morality? And if we say immorality is not the law, But the character, the person, based on the image of God, based on God's tov and ra. And we're saying that sexuality and se sexual alternate reality is simply evidence of people who have abandoned the original tov and ra. Well, then that's that. Notice what the rest of this is going to be. And we're going to work through this list. And then we'll be done. A depraved mind. All right. So now he has established, Paul has established regarding that God has given mankind over because they refuse to obey the image of God, refuse to acknowledge who God is and that they were made in God's name. He said, we've said three times, God gave them over to do whatever they felt like. He says, because of this, and so he mentioned that one of the proofs of this is a change in natural sexuality. Effect, not cause. And since they didn't do this, 
He says, now they gave him over to a depraved mind to do these things which are not proper. And so now um, he's going to list them. So let's look at the list. Let's work our way through the list. Filled with unrighteousness. That's easy. They're not right. Wickedness. That's an easy one, too. Don't really define it. We just say bad stuff. Next one. Greed. Now think about that. Have you gotten a lot of flyers in the mail lately or seen expensive uh, politicians decrying the immorality of greed? And that greed is a sign of rejecting God and His Word, and that we must avoid people who show signs of greed. Have you gotten a lot of that in the mail? No. No? That's weird. <laughs> Me either. In fact, in fact, people who are really good at greed get their own TV shows. <laughs> huh. Well, let's keep going. All right. Evil. That one's an easy one. Evil's fine. Yeah, evil. I hate that. That's bad. Okay, great. Full of envy. We had that one this morning, right? Envy. Jealous. I want what someone else has. Covetousness. You gotta make sure that you don't teach kids that, right? You don't want to expose them to anything. What's that? You don't have to teach them, right? Next one's easy again murder. As long as we forget what Jesus said about what murder really constituted. That if you look at your brother and say you're an idiot, he said that counts. But maybe we'll just take the our narrow definition of killing. Strife. What's the definition for strife? Anybody know? Struggle. Struggle. <laughs> strife is the expression of enmity, strife, debate, contentious debates. It means argue. It means argue. So are you in God's word? Huh? Are you in God's word? It it it's I don't think it's that specific. It means to just to be contrary. Constantly. You're constantly you know, you say something, oh really? Really? Arguing. All right, you gotta go back. Where were we? Deceit. To cheat. No, look. That which gives a false impression. Whether by appearance, statement, or influence. So it says there, they, they accepted. Even just giving a false impression. Huh. Malice. So that one. A vicious character. So basically, you want bad for people. How is that different from evil? Evil is, evil, this is you want bad for people, this is just you like the bad. And now this is you want the bad to happen to someone. 
So it's it's kind of applied evil, I guess, for others. You know, like evil is a oh, I like bad things. Malice is I hope bad things happen to you. Alright? That's a good question. Gossips. Uh oh. Now we're gonna pause there for a second. Well, let's throw in with gossips. Slanders. They tell lies about other people. So now, let's just pause here. Our question, starting off today, was what is morality? And what we settled on the most easily was sex. How many of these so far have anything to do with sex? None of them. And the two verses that are people's favorite verses for talking about how bad sex or sin is said, actually, those are just a symptom. But now that he's saying, now let me tell you about a depraved mind, not a word about sex. So he's spending way more time not on anything to do with sexual. So, but we have defined morality primarily by sexual ethics. But according to Romans 1, the upending of sexual ethic is the result of all these things. It's the result of exchanging the image of God for the image of man. But again, think about what you hear, especially Christian leaders and Christian, quote unquote, Christian politicians in our culture today, urging us to take back the culture for God. Is this the list? Especially just thinking like some of these. Is this the stuff that they are most concerned that we not do? You know, I heard the entire school board was pedophile. That's not gossip or slander, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm just fighting for God's kingdom. We're not done. Haters of God. This one's a crazy one. Because they may talk about God all the time. Like Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, and the Pharisees, for God's people, protecting God's word, right? How did the Pharisees feel about God? Well, they would have said they were the true believers. Well, what did they do when they met God? Killed him. Killed him! Which is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> they killed him. All right, we got to start a new line here. Insolent. Anyone remember what insolent meant? We talked about it. I think last week in some of the We defined insolent. Anybody remember? No. Despiteful. Injurious. It means to tear people down. It means to tear people down. Notice the Greek word, hubristes. Hubris. You make yourself better than them. Alright. Boastful. Now I'm going to give you a choice. Which is worse? Someone who promotes an alternate sexual ethic or someone who is boastful? Boastful. Which one's worse? Aren't they technically equal because sin is sin? 
I was waiting for someone else to, to, to say it, but yeah. But yeah, it doesn't feel strong, does it? That doesn't feel the right. Uh, oh, both, everybody both. I was going to say, to some extent, everybody both. Everybody both. Well, why? Because how do we define morality? By these two verses, not these. And yet these say that these are all the result of a depraved mind. A mind that no longer is fixed on God. Which means that this is equally immoral. But we would say that this is not immoral. It's a minor character for them. We're not going to kick people out of church for being boastful. Mm. Alternate sexuality, yes. Boastful. Uh -huh. That's the point. Inventors of evil. Some of these are easy, right? Inventors of evil sounds easy. Hate that one. I already missed the arrogant. Did I miss arrogant? Oh man, I didn't want to miss arrogant. Where is it? The fingers right by it. Arrogant before boastful. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, arrogant. I don't know any politicians are uh, that definite. Probably like these are the skittles. <laughs> I'm the one just fired them. <laughs> Disobedient to parents. Now, this one's a weird one because <laughs> as adults, you don't have to obey them anymore, right? Uh, <laughs> So before we get to the last four, let's just consider this list. We started with not me, say what is going on. And when we think about how our world is falling into immorality, we tend to mean the redefinition of natural, historical, sexual ethics and identity. So much so that it is the driving our culture wars today. It is what animates politicians, laws, school boards, parents. It's in the news all the time to fight over these two verses. But then Paul says that God gave them over to this list to act like this. He said these are improper. This is immoral. And none of these are sexual, primarily. They're not describing sexual activity at all. He says, but this is immoral behavior. But this does not represent the image of God. Man's totally wrong. But we hear that, don't we? Even when we just say a minute ago, well, hey, everyone's like that. Well, then what's our standard? We are. So I'm a little boastful. I know I shouldn't be, but everyone is. So I'm not talking about God anymore. I'm talking about us. And comparatively speaking, I'm less boastful. So what is the image I'm expressing? Man's image. And I'm a pretty good image of man. Better than some of those other guys. But I don't deny it. What's that? Boy, it might be. It might, oh, oh, man, look at him go. But you see, but th this is going to, I want to let this sit for a minute, because this is really going to be not how any of us are used to thinking. We don't see, we look at this behavior and we say it's rude. It's not nice. But it 
this is not about be, not being nice. I one of the things that kind of bugs me a little bit. Okay, sorry, bugs me a lot. Is one politician in particular who is amazing at some of these things, like has raised the practice of some of these to an art form, and got a TV show to celebrate. And people say, "Oh, so you're not going to support him because he's a little mean?" I'm like, "He's not a little mean. He's insolent, boastful, arrogant." He's a gossip and a slanderer. He uses deceit and he spreads strife. And these things are condemned of God and said this is a result of a depraved mind that are not proper, that are proof of God's withdrawing his presence. So don't tell me, well, just because he's a little mean. No, we're not talking about, we're talking, what's your definition of morality? And if your definition of morality is don't have the wrong kind of sex, but you can be me. You shouldn't be. Well, then your definition of morality is about this big, and it's not based on the image of God. And we're not done. We haven't quite finished our list. Because he's been specific up to now, but then he's going to do... Because he's, he's gone kind of zoomed in, and now, as he wraps up in 31, he's going to zoom back out. So let's erase this. And he's going to go back to kind of broad categories just to sum himself up here. So they are without... Understanding. We need to really touch on this first this is the, I'll, I'll show you the word here. It means to be foolish or unintelligent. So think in terms of wisdom, which is understanding the difference between tov and Ra. And, and when our kids were little, we tried to teach them this. Whether we're successful or not, it's a different question. But we tried to teach the kids primarily not by hear the rules, please follow them. You have to do that some. But we tried to teach them to be wise. That's what the Bible says. Be wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, like, I, I've told this story before, and I don't remember which kid it is, so it's not really making all the night of them. <laughs> but I remember coming into the living room at, when we lived over here at the Parsonage, and they had this little couch. It was like a piece of foam, about this big, and they put it on the couch. And we had an overstuffed couch, you know, so the cushions are kind of bulgy. And they put the poo couch on top of the couch. And then they put, we had this big pillow, like big pillow, and uh, they put the pillow on top of the couch. And then they put a desk, plastic desk, a little plastic kid's desk, on top of that. And then they put the, the stool that goes with the desk on top of that. And they were creating a chair. Pretty scary. <laughs> and my first words were, that's not a good idea. <laughs> Why? Because this thing's not. You're going to get on top of that thing. Wah! I mean, it's going to be bad. I did not say, all right, new rule. No stacking five things on the couch and trying to stand on them. Because at next time, what are they going to do next time? Stack four or six. You said five. Man. But I said, this, that's a bad idea. It's going to fall over. You're going to get hurt. There are going to be negative results to your choice. I'm trying to teach them wisdom. Is this good or is this bad? It's not evil. It's not, you know, when that, when that chair went on there, you summoned the demon. No, it's not evil. But it's bad, you're going to break your neck. Tov and Ra, understand what is good and bad according to God, wisdom. Understanding, it says, but these guys, because they've abandoned God's view of reality, really, they're without understanding. And then three more words. They are untrustworthy. Yeah, we define that 
but here it's being defined as the ultimate immorality. To me, that's much less comfortable. They are unloving. And they are unmerciful. In other words, all those specific things, he's now broken them into four big categories. They don't have wisdom, God's wisdom. They're not trustworthy, they're not loving, and they're not merciful. Although they know what God wants, those who practice these things are worthy of death. And they don't only do that, but they heartily approve others who practice them. And so the final thing of immorality is to cheer this on. And say, I approve of those who do that. I don't know about you, but that's uncomfortable. Because it is easy to define morality as far as degrading passions. That's simple. And as long as that's not us, we can say those people are doing bad things. Evil, it's going to bring the wrath of God down upon us. Let's fight them. How are we going to fight them? Oh, well, we may do some of these things down here. But like I said this morning, I'm running into pastors, conservative churches, some of them Baptist churches, very conservative churches, who preach the Bible, sometimes even preach it right from the original King James that God wrote in. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> and they are insolent. They're arrogant. They're boastful. They're gossips. They're very unloving and unmerciful. You're soft. You're liberal. You're liberal. You're soft. Because you're not taking the nice hard stand that needs to be taken. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So earlier you had mentioned, like, um, we may not kick somebody out of the church who's boastful, but um, the whole sex thing, we might. But wouldn't couldn't that be considered as unloving? Oh, yeah, okay. So now, what does it mean to be unloving? And I can't go too far down that rabbit hole. That'd be fun. Um, because we have to define what unloving means. Unloving doesn't mean never say hard things, you know, if, I'm, if unloving means I never tell my kids no, that's actually not loving because now I raise spoiled brats. So we have to, again, but that comes back to your main point, we have to come back to that these things are defined either by what we think or God's told them wrong. How does God define these? Because oftentimes what we do is we, we don't define this God's way, which is broader than our definition, and we don't define merciful God's way. Because what I'm hearing from some of these guys is they're saying, the minute you say, well, you need to be more loving, more merciful, they say you're too soft. That that is not what the moment requires. That in order to fight immorality, we may have to accept some of this. And the minute they think that way, they are revealing that their picture of immorality doesn't include the list in 29, 30, and 31. Their list of immorality is only 26 and 27. And so as we walk into the world, so now let's, let's come around here. These are all the actions of the flesh. All of this, this whole chapter, is says because they abandoned the image of God, replaced it with the image of man, all this is the result. So next week is rebuilding the image. But what I have to realize is everything we've talked about today, all of it is immorality. Because immorality is not, are you following certain rules in the Bible? Remember, we said, is it rules? Or is it who you are as a person? Because 
God has brought his truth into the world, not in the form of a ruler, but in the form of an image. And it's supposed to be us. In our way of thinking, relationships, and you think different from somebody else, then you begin to think they're untrustworthy, presidents, whatever. Um, how do you get a happy medium? Kids are famous for saying, well, you grew up and you did that. you got to let me do what I want. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, if you do what you want, do you like it when I do or Dad does? Right. Well, no. How is that any better if you're doing that? Right. Because the minute you make that argument, whether it's, well, they did so we need to, or they did so I should be able to, or they're no better than me. Those are all true statements. But they're all saying so that the rule that governs my behavior, the moral rule, is the image of man, not the image of God. And that's why what Jesus said, he says, now you've heard this, but I tell you. Like he says, you've heard it, love your friends and hate your enemies. Why? Because that's natural. That's the natural man. That's the image of man. It's normal to like those who like you, and people who mean to you, or treat you terribly, or abuse you. You don't have to like them. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and do good to the people who try to abuse you. That's a different image. They do. Which, they do, exactly, because it says it becomes foolishness. It becomes foolishness. Their hearts are darkened and they become foolish. And they go, so then when they see God, they go, that's nuts. They don't want me to have any fun. Well, look at, think of, a uh, great picture of this is uh, the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. Aslan, if you haven't read it, I'm about to spoil it. I'm sorry, but all of you are old enough, just shut up by now. <laughs> Aslan is giving up his life to the White Witch to save Edmund. Because Edmund belongs to the white witch. She has broken the rules. So Aslan goes and surrenders himself to Aslan. And as he's now tied to the stone table, he's been shaved and abused. And as she gets ready to plunge the knife in, she says, Because once you're dead, I'll get him too. You're a fool, Aslan. Because it looks stupid. Why would you just not? And that's why people say now, when people say, hey, we need to be nice to the bad people, people say, well, you're weak and you're stupid. That won't work. Why? The only thing they understand is power. And so we need to go by their rules, which is what the image of. So our so if we're going to bring morality, are we going to bring rules? Or are we going to bring the opposite character of earthly Tovan Ra? And so we will be loving, we will be trustworthy, we will be merciful. We won't hate our enemies. I think I already told you the story, um, but somebody in the second service this morning referenced the execution of the Christians in, I think it's Jordan, I don't know exactly, but a bunch of ISIS leaders rounded up about 15 Christian men, right along the beach, it's all on video, and they brought them out along the Coast of some water, and then they beheaded them. And the world was outraged. Because it's brutal. It's terrible. Over just for no other reason than you're Christians and we're, you follow Allah, you're an infidel. What happened next is not as widely known. But the families of those men who were brutally, publicly on video executed forgave the execution. And the forgiveness and the attitude, because these are Coptic Christians, greet the Islamics out. One Imam, Muslim leader, he said, What is this power you possess? We don't possess this power. And you can forgive. Because the Quran, you revenge, you make enemies pay. The enemies of God are, that's why they executed him in the first place. He says, and you forgive them? How could you? And they were, they were scared. It freaked them out. They were frightened. 
by the power of these people, how in the world could you forgive? That is so unnatural. And they were scared by the power of the image of God. And you see that when Jesus died and the Roman centurion sitting there and goes, that boy, he had to be some of God. Oh my word, what's going on? Because what does he hear? He hears that guy up there and he says, God will forgive me. They don't understand. And the centurion's like, oh, what power is this? It's not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with tov. Not with, well, they're going to be evil. They did it, so we're going to fight back fire with fire. No, we fight back with mercy. We fight back with love. Paul said, when we are accused, we conciliate. And he says, yeah, we've become fools for Christ. This is a stupid way to do it. If it's just human rules. So next week we're going to look at the image restored, which we're going to take us to Romans 8. Romans 8, we mostly know from Romans 8, when there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But we're going to look at how Romans 8 shows what this new image of God is. So as we represent ourselves as Christians, whether it's in a local town, or whether it's in state, or whether it's nationally, we need to be careful that we use the full de definition from Romans of immorality. Because when immorality is just about sex, it's about this one, and then everything else is okay. It's just character for us. But that's why I look and I say, I, when I see these three things, which is the summary, as a sign of the immoral person. But I've done almost all the talking. I promised discussion. We had almost not. Sorry. But I think I've, yeah, I kept them within the time. We started 10 minutes late. I've gone less than an hour. So thoughts, discussion. Questions, disagreement, argue me back, say, that's wrong. Or just tell me what you're thinking. Christy. I just feel like, I mean, it's, it, you know, when you're seeing it, the little words, like, ooh, I don't do that. Ooh, I do that sometimes. Ooh, but then when you put it, the untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, it's that jolt of reality because it is broadened. Because when it's microscope, you can pick and choose and justify. But I can't even wrap my head around. I would never want somebody to describe me in any of those ways. Mm. You know, and it just, it makes you okay. So my opinion doesn't matter. It's what does God say? You know what I mean? So it kind of just makes you take a step back to, okay, I need to really, as the Bible says, think before you talk. And my son says, think before you talk. But and my husband says, <laughs> think before you talk. But it really makes you realize that it's a whole lot more. And we are accountable for everything we say, do, and think. To realize that it's a lot more than just the sexuality mm -hmm. stuff. Like it holds you to the heart that you Yeah. The other thing that, that blows me away is the last two things that the crazy mind and I've grown up and been in church my whole life and a lot of my understanding of Christianity was the last two. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that's a generalization of how it's portrayed, but you end up Looking down on those people who aren't merciful to them and just invite them. So, you know, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Other than that? Okay, what about like boundaries? Okay. Oh, boundaries? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, when you mentioned uh, like getting somebody out of the church. Um, you had mentioned okay, 
isn't that a mother? No, um, I, what you're saying is no, because you wouldn't love him when I, you know, uh, talk to him about it and talk to him about it or whatever. So that's sort of like boundaries too, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, you can have boundaries but still be loving. So, so let's let's. That's a very good question. And and are are you thinking? Are you thinking especially Sorry. like even within the church? Oh, I mean, just in general. But no, let's no, let's, in the world. You well, know. Let's use the example of the church, just okay. because that was the original, okay. and that they kick someone out of church. They comment that I mean. Um, first, let's start with where we our first initial thought of it, which is well, what's one of the things that a church does? It polices polices its membership to make sure everybody's ought to be in there. And if you shouldn't be, then we initiate church discipline and have a series of steps of confrontation to try to get them straightened out so they can stay. Almost everything I just said is not in the Bible. I mean, Romans 18 is not written to the church. It's about when somebody has an issue with someone else. But we use Romans 18 as the temper. The words church says one appear nowhere in the New Testament. And you do not see the church being described in the New Testament in a policing function. Now, having said that, what about boundaries? Does that mean that you're not supposed to put up with stuff in the church? No, actually, several of the letters in the New Testament are written to address sin in the church that was not being addressed properly. And it included the idea of moving somebody out. So obviously, there is a some sort of corrective fashion. But that's where we have to come back to say, well, how do we, when we start trying to figure out what does it mean to shepherd people and set boundaries, how do we think about this? We have to start with, well, what is our picture of what's good and bad? And most of our picture of good and bad, again, is very narrow to... These things are big deals, and most of them have to do with sex. And the rest of these are character flaws that you should work on. But like, when somebody had premarital sex, or got pregnant, and a marriage, or anything like that, I remember growing up, that was a big deal. And then, some of this behavior was a staple of every church business meeting we ever had. That was not a big deal. Because that wasn't immoral. The moral was what happened that she got pregnant. And so the minute we do that, now we're we're way off. Because A, we're policing, and B, we're policing based on a standard that isn't biblical because we're forgiving all this stuff and not forgiving this stuff. So now, first, so first we have to say, I gotta make sure I'm doing the right understanding. Now having the right understanding, how do I deal with people that are off base? Do we address it? Yes. How do we address it? Well, we start by not addressing it under these terms. I can't address it in an unloving and unmerciful way. Because my goal isn't to police, because morality is not about following the rules. Morality is about following Jesus. Okay? So I'll use Cindy as an example. So he's like, oh, great. <laughs> all right, so Cindy, I find out Cindy's been up to no good. She's been doing all kinds of bad things. We won't enumerate what they are, but they're bad. They're really bad. <laughs> so I'm going to come to Cindy now. What is the problem? Are they bad because she's breaking the rules? Under morality, under well, human definition of morality, yes, she's breaking the rules. I need to get her to stop breaking the rules. What did Jesus say real morality was? Her heart. So instead of coming and saying, Cindy, you got to stop doing that stuff. That's bad. And say, like, so why are you doing that stuff? Do you love Jesus? Okay, well, I thought you did. You joined us. You're part of the church. You declared your faith in Christ. These behaviors aren't consistent with following Jesus. And she goes, well, I think it is. All right, well, let's look at the Bible. Look, these behaviors take you away from really obeying and submitting to the rules of Jesus in your life. It's not about the rules, it's about his rule. His lordship. Well, I don't care. Okay, so what you're telling me is you don't care what Jesus says, you want to do whatever you want. Notice now, it's not about rules, it's about heart. Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. It's a problem. That's so bad for you. 
It's not, are you worthy to be here? God is worthy to be here, but you are rejecting the Messiah. That's dangerous for you. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to try to enlist. I'm going to go to Clay and say, Clay, you and Cindy have been playing courage every, every week for a year. Maybe you can get through the curve better than I can. To try to help her see that turning her back on Jesus the way she's doing is not good for her. But she says, thank you. If we're going to do that, we're not going to do it anymore. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> so then I go to maybe some of the other leaders of the church, maybe ladies, and say, can you go to the house? And some people say, oh, no. So finally say, this is, you are, you are rejecting the body of Christ. And so we're going to now treat you as an unbeliever. Is that a punishment? No. But you have said that you aren't following Jesus, so we're going to treat you like someone who does it, which means now what? The witness. Some of you need to turn to Jesus. I love Jesus. Why become? Because you can't see what God and you see. And so I'm, I'm going to try to do the same. And that may really bug her. Why well, I am saved. Why yeah. Because if you're saved, how can you so easily turn your back? But no, that looks different than church discipline, doesn't it? But those are boundaries. No, you can't just keep doing that. But what am I trying to do? Bring her back. And since I'm trying to win her back to Jesus. Because the standard is Jesus, not the rules. The rules are just things that help you see that something's wrong. But my goal is to restore her heart to obedience to Christ by surrender. And that's how we're supposed to church system. That's what we try to do. And that's why we don't always hit a formal process and we don't always get to vote on things. Because it's like, well, that person has already rejected Jesus, so we kind of got that treatment is unbeliever. They can't the rules. But we didn't discipline them. That's not actually a biblical term. The goal is to try to bring them to repentance if they don't treat them like an They're now outside the body. Those are your boundaries. That's not a punishment. Other than God gave them over. Alright, we're done trying to we're done trying to stop it. I remember this. And sometimes we didn't hear we had a couple ladies that left their husbands and when we finally put them out of fellowship. The words I said in the business meeting, I said, now when you talk to them, do not confront them over the sin. Because now they're not accountable for sin. You don't walk up to any non believer and say, hey, are you sleeping around? It's none of your business. <laughs> because they're not submitting to Christ anymore. So some of our messages be reconciled to God. Come under God's dominion. Because he has made us and for his forgiveness and mercy. Be Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah, I, I was thinking about the world and typical people and not and being monks and, and having the boundaries. If, if you have boundaries, it's not that you're on No, no, it's very good. Yeah. Well, here's another example, and this actually happened here over a decade ago, but we had a woman who was in an abusive, an abusive marriage situation. And me and some of the other elders, I think her friends and involved in the church, we've been this a long time ago now. Um, we went to the woman and we said, You need to move out. Sep- get, you need to separate. Not divorce, separate. Because his behavior is wrong and harmful to you and the children. So separate, set up a safe zone, and then invite him in. But the only way he's allowed to come in is helpful. Why? That's a loving thing. You're not rejecting him, you're offering. You're not pushing, you're pulling. But if he refuses to be healthy, well, your hands are tied. But the invitation is there. But you are establishing health for you and the kids. And then you're inviting him to join the health piece. And if he doesn't, you didn't reject him. Those are boundaries. And there are people, I had a, a guy one time who was a Christian, really mad at me. Um, he, I didn't really know him, but well, he was from down south. I never met him in person called me up to tell me how I was wrong about things. And he got pretty abusive on the phone. I finally said, sir, you're not going to keep talking to me this way. I said, I'm happy to do the date this way. I'm happy to discuss with you. But you will not stand this way. So he goes, oh, so he calmed down. A few minutes later, he's right back to full rant, rain, and abusive speech. And I said, sir, I'm going to say again. You are not going to speak to me this way. Or I'm going to stand this way. And he called me. But then two or three minutes, he's right back. I said, sir, this is the last time I'm going to ask you. You will be respectful. 
for it, but not going to continue to try. And he goes, well, haven't you ever been just really mad, really frustrated? I said, sir, right now, I am incredibly both of those things. <laughs> I said, so yeah. And he got real quiet. He goes, yeah, I can bet you are, because I've been pretty aggressive. I said, yes, you have. He said, you are the best and after that, he stayed under control. But I'm like, no, I don't have to keep talking. I want to. You're upset. I want to hear what you're upset about. And if you need to tell me how wrong I am, I, I will sit there and listen. I will. I do not have to have you just. You are able to control yourself. So if you want to yell at me, no. If you want to tell me, yes. And then, then he did. Boundaries. Say, so, I will engage with you. But I can set healthy boundaries. Now, I was not loving. The minute I became unmerciful to him, you're yelling at me, so I can yell at you. Not in shame him, but when I said, have you ever been mad? Yes, I'm, right now, I'm angry. And he wrote by this, I bet you are. And now that I've done that, I shamed him. But did I try to shame him? No. By your good behavior, you're burning holes on my hands. Soft answer comes away right. Now, I'm overcoming this evil. Good. Oh, God. I feel kind of ashamed. I wanted to say, yeah, you should, sir, but that would then, I admit I do that. Now I'm, yeah, okay, I already just blew it. Good, those are good questions. Other other thoughts or questions on this? These are good. This is big and messy. Other thoughts on this? Like I said, next week we're going to do the Imagery Sword, and then that will be the end of this little mini series. We'll do, we'll do some other stuff. I wanted to make each one of these kind of nice and compact so you can do them in bite sized pieces. I originally thought of one other thing and I lost it and we're definitely over time now. So that's a really, those are good questions. Feel free, burn questions next week. We can even throw in a fourth week for just the answer questions if you want. Um, but let's close with prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word. Your word is deep, rich, and powerful. Sometimes we kind of treat it a little uh, lightly you know, it, as a mention mm-hmm. to some of these things. Pick out the parts that seem to work well for us and not see your whole counsel. Lord, thank you for the writing here in Romans 1. Thank you that you come to us and we are undeserving. We are fallen people. We've gone our own way. We are rebels and cosmic traitors. And your response was to come with grace and mercy to live among us, to save when you showed up. You said you didn't come to judge. You came to save. Not to condemn, but to save. Lord, you stood up for truth. You called out evil. You called out bad. But you also called people into your love and repentance and your mercy and your grace. Lord, help us to do that, Lord, as we come into another election season, as we find ourselves pulled into the structures of our of our corner of the world, the way our civilization and our country works. Lord, we are tempted to try to find a way we fit the best, but really we don't fit at all because your kingdom is not of this world. Lord, may we stand apart as being substantially different, such that it even scares people to say that our reactions are not natural because they are supernatural. They are born out of the God of the universe living and shining through us, that we would demonstrate your image to those around us. Lord, we just thank you for our opportunities you'll give us this week as we just run into simple disputes, whether it's a business dispute, a traffic dispute, different things that can cause us to slip back into our humanity instead of your image. But in all the little interactions, whether at the grocery store, the gas station, work, out having fun, that in every aspect you would reflect the love, grace, mercy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, of your spirit reigning through us, reflecting your picture and image. Thank you, Father. Give us a great rest of the day and a week ahead. Thanks for coming out, guys.